what's that? Okay, thanks, Rob. I'm a rookie. So uh, thank you, Louie, and uh, my name is Saul Hernandez. I am not Robert Russell. For some of those of you that may be visiting our, our church, Robert Russell is our pastor, and he's a gifted teacher and a, a just a uh, wonderful person, and we're really blessed to have him. But he is, he is gone for a couple of weekends, so he asked, he's asked a couple of his elders to fill in. And so when Robert asked me to speak a few weeks ago, actually it's more than that, it's about a couple months ago, uh, he knew a little bit about my background, and so he said, I want you to talk about being a shepherd. So I said, okay. Um, my, uh, I married into a farming family. My wife uh, and her family have farmed over in Dishner Valley in Washington County, Virginia for, I don't know, six, seven generations, a long, long time. And when we were, um, when we were, uh, uh, and we started farming too, we got married, moved back to Bristol and started farming. We started raising cattle. And our kids were young then, my oldest, my boys, I don't think Julie wasn't even born, I don't believe. Uh, we wanted them to be involved in the farm. The problem is with cattle, right, they're big and they're dangerous uh, and it can be tough. I remember sometimes we'd work the cattle and we'd have to put the boys in the back of the truck because we didn't want them to get hurt. So we thought we really wanted to be engaged. We really wanted them to have this hands-on experience. So we decided to get into the sheep business. And back then, sheep prices were really, really high and Cattle prices were low and there were small ruminants and so the kids could deal with them and handle them and we didn't have to worry about getting hurt. So um, that's how we got into the sheep business and that was probably, I don't know, 15 years ago or so. And um, since then, you know, we really, we started out with just a few ewes and then we, our flock grew and grew and grew to the point that we got to one point where we had 150 ewes and uh, if you do, if you know anything about sheep, they average about two lambs per ewe, right? So we were lambing close to 300 lambs uh, a season. And in a lambing, when you do lambing, it all comes in about a month. I'll talk about that in a little in, in a minute there. So you got about 300 babies born in a month. So that's what we did. We got into, we got into lambing. So, and that's, Robert's been to our farm and he knows we do sheep. And so, and it's really interesting because, um, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but the, the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep is, is, other than the family relationship in the Bible, there's more said about that particular relationship than any other relationship in the Bible. And because we live in a modern society where we don't really have the context, we don't know sheep shepherds, right? Uh, we kind of have this vision of, well, babe, I guess is, I love that movie. Everybody remember the movie, babe, you know, that's kind of our vision of sheep, right? And we think about the sheep dogs. And so, but in reality, that's not really, uh, an accurate version, right? Of, of sheep. And I think it's really important to think about in the context of when Jesus and the Bible, when Jesus was speaking about sheep and when the Bible was written, you know, understanding that dynamic. So with that though, before we get into the meat of our message, I want to give you a little quick highlight, some quick facts on sheep and shepherds. So, and also, by the way, do we have any veterinarians in the house? Anybody, large animal vets? I don't see any. Okay. Do we have any people that have raised sheep or cat or sheep, not cattle, but sheep? No, nobody. So I can tell you anything. I, I can tell you anything. Y'all are going to just believe it, I guess, but go home and Google it. Hopefully you'll realize I'm, I'm, I'll try to be straight with you. All right. So here we go. Sheep in the Bible. It's really interesting. I said that, and I didn't know this until I started studying. There's over 500 mentions of sheep in the Bible in practically every book, right? From Genesis with Cain and Abel. Abel was a shepherd, right? All the way to Revelation. Where, where Jesus is referred to the Lamb of God. And there's a story, and, and I bet some of you are thinking about, there is story after story about sheep in the Bible. The Bible is literally peppered with references to sheep and shepherds. So, uh, and, and b reason being is, is the, the Hebrews were nomads. For the most part, they depended on the sheep for their livelihood, right? Uh, so it was, it, was a pretty, it was a pretty common thing, unlike today. Now, the other thing about sheep is, Throughout the Bible, and this is what probably everybody's most familiar with, uh, they're used symbolically to refer to God's people, right? So often, us, right, God's people, we're referred to as sheep. 
And I've said this in the last couple times, uh, uh, last couple teachings. Uh, I, I heard somebody say something about, well, you know, sheep are really stupid. Uh, they're kind of like us, stupid. And, uh, you know, I've been shepherding for a little while. I'm certainly not an expert. Uh, I've slept at a couple holiday inns before. I had to throw that in. Uh, I'm certainly not an expert, right? I've been to a lot of classes and learned on the job. But I can tell you, I, sh- sheep are not stupid. Sheep are not stupid. They're simple. Uh, they're fairly naive. Oftentimes they're uh, predictable, right? But they're not stupid. As a matter of fact, sheep have an, oh, well, I call it a hypersensitivity to their surroundings. Kind of like a baby, and you got to worry about a baby overstimulating a baby. That's the way sheep are. They are very keen and aware, especially of potential danger. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, sheep, completely defenseless and need a shepherd to survive. One of the few only animals that have no natural defenses. So if a sheep is to survive, it has to fully and completely depend on the shepherd. You know, I talked up earlier that there's no such thing as feral sheep, right? You go parts of the country, there's feral pigs. You go to the Outer Banks, there's horses. Um, I got a neighbor that lets his chickens out and they'll live up on the hill and survive out in the woods for, you know, because they have natural defenses, they roost, right? All kinds of animals, you know, dogs and such. And there's a few that are most, but, but sheep are just utterly defenseless and dependent on the shepherd to survive. Next thing about sheep is, of course, in the Old Testament, Hebrews, right? They were used as, as sacrifices to atone for sin, uh, right? The, the, the uh, Hebrews knew that, uh, you know, that God was righteous and holy and sin had separated them from an almighty, holy, righteous God. And so they used lambs. Typically, they were ram lambs. That means they were males, right? Um, they were typically spotless. And there were a lot of other criteria, but for the most part, they were used as sacrifices. They were propitiation for our sins, right? That's a fancy word for those lambs paid. And, of course, it had to, they had to do it over and over again, right? Paid uh, for those sins that they had committed, right? They put those sins on those lambs. And so uh, they were they they were in atonement. So that's a little bit about sheep. Now shepherds in the Bible. So everybody has kind of like their favorite character, like their Marvel comic character or football player, right? I got like a favorite shepherd, All right? So there and there's a lot of prominent shepherds in the Bible, right? There was Abel, Abraham, Moses, but to me King David, as far as an earthly shepherd, he was the man. And we'll talk about this in a little bit. But anyway, but but again, that theme, very, very important, right? Because we have all sorts of instances of these folks that we looked up to, these heroes of the faith, they were shepherds, right? Other thing about shepherds, shepherds were the lowliest of the low. If you were not fit to do anything else in the family structure, right? You were designated to be the shepherd. Think about King David, right? Seven siblings. He was the youngest. How did he end up? Because he was the littlest guy, you know? He ended up being, right, the shepherd. And we all know what happened, right, eventually, right? That training that he received as a shepherd, fighting the bears and lions to protect the sheep, came in pretty handy when he faced the giant Goliath, right? So so they were the lowliest of the lowly, and, um, and they weren't fit for absolutely anything else. And it was a pretty, I mean, you think about it, unlike today, the shepherds in, in, in those times, they would hang out with their sheep all day, outside, uh, caught in fear for their, really at any point, probably would have to be willing to give their lives to protect those sheep because those sheep were so important, right? So who wants that job? And sheep are stinky, and they don't always pay attention. And it was just a really frustrating job. So, um, and, and, and because of that, and I'm, I'm, I'm putting all this because I want you to think of it's interesting because we're going to talk about Jesus being the good shepherd. Um, 
Uh, and I didn't say this before, but it's interesting that we talk about this relationship between the sheep and these references to sheep and shepherds. I would think if I was writing the Bible, I probably would use more of a relationship between maybe a, a king and his servants maybe or something else. But a shepherd, a lowly shepherd, the lowest of the low, it's kind of interesting. Uh, shepherds are often used in context of leading God's people, right? Pastors and Leaders in the church are often referred to as shepherds. We're not going to talk about that today, but that's very interesting. And then the last thing is, Jesus in John chapter 10, which is our scripture verse, calls himself the good shepherd. So, I said all that to say this, suffice it to say, I think that if we want to understand more about the character of God, right? If we want to have a more intimate relationship, if we want to grow in our faith in our understanding of our relationship to the Good Shepherd, it's important that we know a few things about sheep and shepherds, right? So, so now here, here starts your ag lesson, all right? <laughs> so uh, first thing. So as I thought about all this and I studied on this, I thought about four, what sort of four criterion that make Jesus the good, the good Shepherd. So the first one is he protects his sheep. And that's probably what most people would think of as what the job of a shepherd is. Uh, in John 10, 28, it says, I will give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Now, if you're a shepherd in Southwest Virginia or East Tennessee, there's pro primarily two things that you have to struggle with and worry about, and probably most else parts of the country. Um, some of the individual uh, characters in these two categories may be different, but these are two things that you're going to have to deal with. And I, I, I've never heard this before anywhere else, but I labeled them the two P's, right? The first P is predators. So around here, we deal with coyotes. Um, and coyotes can be absolutely vicious. Where I live over there, I, we live over the ridge of the pinnacle. And uh, our lambing barn is down towards the road, right? So our house is kind of on top of a ridge, and there's a valley, and our lambing barn's down the road, and there's another ridge, and on the other side, it's a pinnacle. And um, we are, have been, we're okay now, but in years past, we have absolutely been uh, infested with coyotes. As a matter of fact, we had such a coyote problem, the fellow who developed the pinnacle uh, eventually hired somebody and trapped and in two nights, he kept, I think he filled two truckloads or two truck beds of coyotes. He trapped about 60 coyotes. And so what happens uh, is in your shepherd, we would lamb all at one time. That means we put our rams, our daddies, in with our mamas all at the same time, and all the babies come at the same time, right, for the obvious reason. So it's hard. You don't lamb all throughout the year. It drives you crazy. The other thing, too, is you lamb when the weather's good, right? So... And what would happen was, because we were so infested with coyotes, and it would, it would almost be creepy because there would be times, especially if you got up early in the morning and crack it on, the coyotes would hunt all night, and they would bring whatever they caught to their babies. And you could hear easily make out a dozen, sometimes more than that, pups. And those pups would go crazy. And they were up on the ridge, and you could hear that echo through the valley. And it was really, really creepy, right, because we had so many coyotes. And so we would lamb... And we would have all these lambs, and of course, lambs smell, and they make noise. And literally, all right, we would be surrounded by these coyotes. Now, I had some help in my ranch security team, I call them, right? These are two uh, Great Pyrenees dogs. And the front one is, uh, I think that's Marcy, I believe, and that may be Gaston. that's sitting up on, on the hill with some of our sheep. Now, they, they have since passed. This, this has been several years ago, right? But so what we would do is Marcy and Gaston and I, besides having a gun, but we would, at nighttime, we'd sleep in the barn. I had a camper down there, so it's not that bad. We would sleep in the barn with all the newborn lambs to make sure that the coyotes didn't have a smorgasbord. And I'll tell you this, as long as we were down there, as long as those dogs were with me, even if the dogs weren't with me, it's just a little easier with the dogs, right? Because that means I could go somewhere else. Those coyotes would not dare come near. They would not dare. They were no match to the shepherd 
and those dogs. None. Now, the moment we got away, and it happened, and it would happen. Occasionally, when you would have a coyote kill, especially a ewe, and this is a little graphic, they wouldn't dismember the ewe. They would, it, it was pretty brutal. They would, they would eat the insides. They would go straight for the heart or the liver or the lungs, right? But at the center, it wasn't like a limb or anything. I mean, they were going after it at the very center uh, of that, that animal, right? But as long as we were there, it's all good. So that's the first P is predators, predators, all right? The second P, parasites, all right? So this is a ewe that's been infected with a parasite. And one of the ways we know it is you see it underneath its chin. It's kind of got that, 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 uh, that ball or whatever. There's a couple different ways. One is because predator, or, or parasites, right, would make these lambs anemic. They would suck, literally suck the blood out of them, right? You could look at something called famacha, but you could look at, the, look at their eyes. You could look at their gums. You could look at their nose. And if it wasn't red or really bright pink, started to tell white, you know those lambs were anemic, that they were absolutely infected by parasites. Now, parasites come in all different shapes and sizes and forms, right? There's tapeworms, gastrointestinal, there's liver flukes, there's lung worms. One particular, um, just insidious, and we only had this happen over oh, thousands of sheep we ever had or lamb, we only had one as a brain worm. Caught it too late and it, it was not pretty, right? We tried to treat it, but by then the damage was done. So, these worms are just, they're just terrible, right? Parasites, and then, so if the parasites don't get you, excuse me, the predators don't get you, the parasites. Now, our solution to parasites, modern shepherds, we, we, uh, we deworm them. So we have all kinds of medicines. I won't name them all, tell you. And there's, you know, different ones at different times and different ones. But the bottom line is we get our sheep, and we'd, 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 we'd get this little metal thing that attached to a backpack, and we'd get it down their throat and squirt this medicine and force this medicine. And what it would do is it would kill the internal parasites. Now, what would happen was, because these sheep were in these pastures infested by parasites, once we wormed them, we had to turn them out in a different pasture. Because what do you think would happen if we wormed these sheep and turned them back out into the same pasture they were? they would get reinfected, right? The larvae would still be in the manure, the larvae would be in the grass, right? And they would get infected. So one of the things, Ken, we had to do, and so, but while I was doing this lesson and I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about old shepherds and my man, King David, I was thinking, well, how in the world, before the days of ivermectin and valbazin and some of y'all that have raised cattle, sidectin, all these things, those names sound familiar, how did they worm sheep? And I started reading and studying about all natural methods of deworming sheep. And there's a couple of different ones and things you can give them, a sort of biodiversity and grasses. But the main way to these Old Testament shepherds kept the sheep from getting intestinal parasites is they would constantly move them to greener and greener pasture because these larvae would only go about an inch or two up the grass. Right? So if you had a sheep that was grazing on five or six inch grass, they never reconsumed that larvae. Right? And I thought immediately about Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want of anything. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And you know, as I think about this first point and this first quality of a good shepherd, I think. You know, tremendous spiritual application, right? Because we've been studying this series with Robert about spiritual warfare and the fact that there is a reality that even though we may not see it, it exists and that there are spiritual predators, outside predators, right? That can manifest themselves in a lot of different ways, evil spirits, if you will, and all kinds of things that are seeking to absolutely devour and destroy us. And was it not? For the good shepherd protecting us, it wouldn't, be, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be pretty. But I think we can take a lot of assurance in knowing that we have got a shepherd, just like those coyotes would never even think of approaching us, that's gonna, that, that can protect us, right? If we're willing to submit ourselves to the will of that shepherd. 
And then I think about the second P, which is parasites. And, and, and that's akin to, you know, that's another, how many spiritual parasites that we have within us, right, that are just seeking from within, I guess maybe sin, um, maybe addictions, maybe all kinds of things, you know, a litany of things that are seeking to destroy us, right? And the shepherd wants to worm us, but what do we, you know, but if he were to worm us, or if we were to fight the shepherd and go back into that same infected pasture, we get sick again. And it's just a constant cycle, right? So, um, you know, I'm thankful that we, that we uh, if you know him, right, you have a shepherd that seeks to protect you from the spiritual predators and the spiritual parasites. All right, so that's number one. Number two, another quality of a good shepherd is he knows how to lead and guide his sheep. Another verse, John 10, it says, The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Now, this is out in our paddock. I kind of like this picture. I picked this picture because you've got, they're all kind of looking in different ways, right? You know, the, 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 the music, the song we sing about, they're, they're prone to wonder. Yeah, they're, they're definitely prone to wonder, right? So, but what's interesting is, as a shepherd, he wants to relocate or move his sheep. Uh, it's typically for a good thing, right? We want to move them to greener pasture. We want to uh, vaccinate them and deworm them. And there's really three different ways that you can do that. Uh, the first way is represented by this picture. This is my daughter, by the way, and this is a cute picture, so everybody needs to go, aw. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, and this is a neat picture, and I'll talk about it in a minute here, too, because of the way she's facing, right? But this is, I don't know if you can tell, there's some metal gates right there, and we're getting ready to work these sheep. Vaccinate. Work is our word for vaccinate. But anyway, there's three ways that you can move sheep. One way is to guide them, and that's what you typically think of when you think of sheepdogs. And I'm standing over here on this end of the stage because I want you to have sort of a visual image, right? If I am going to move sheep and they're in front of me from here to there, I want to guide them, right? Maybe through that exit door. Often people think, kind of like cattle, you get some momentum, you push them, you rush them, you get harder. And as they start moving, you move quicker and boom. And that's the way they go. That is not the way sheep work, okay? Every flock has, and it's based on the individual members of that flock, and it's just, they have a personality, if you will. And every flock has what I call a bubble, which is this sort of imaginary line drawn around the bubble. And if you want to guide sheep to a certain direction, you have to push and push and push, but you cannot break that bubble. The moment you break that bubble, those sheep scatter. Sometimes they do what I call double back. They'll literally turn and, and they go left brain and they freak out and they'll turn and actually charge you and they'll jump and it's crazy. It's a zoo, right? So, and what's also interesting too, when you're guiding sheep, and this is a shepherd crook, I'll talk about this here in a sec. What's interesting here is you're, when you're guiding sheep is there's always, often, often, there's a recalcitrant or a leader in the flock right? You can break that. And that's why I think it's kind of neat because Julie's looking the other way and that's what they do. So if I have a flock of sheep on the stage that I want to move that way and I have one of these recalcitrant, um, you know, sheep looking at me, there's no way I'm going to move those sheep. No way. Even if I stay outside the bubble, what I've got to do is I've got to turn it, right? Because what will happen is they will go where the leader is. And I often told my boys when we were raising sheep, I said, boys, you don't herd the flock, you herd those leaders. And what I would do and what can be done sometimes, you know, you have a shepherd crook, right? It makes you big and you use it for lambs too. And I'll show you that in a minute, but it kind of makes you big and you can tap. But sometimes it was, it was little nuances. Like I would just snap my fingers and they would hear me and that would be enough. Or to go, sheep, sheep, sheep just that little bit, because they could hear me, right? So, so the shepherd has to know his flock and how they respond to those small little signals, right? So that's one way, is to guide them. Another way, which we often think about, and is the easiest way, I wish it was the only way, but is the easiest way is to lead your sheep. 
And that would often, right, you do that from the front. That, the, but the only way that can happen is you have to have a, a, a shepherd that's pretty intimate with his flock. That means he'd had to spend a lot of time and those sheep know his voice. They know exactly what he sounds like. They're comfortable with him. Sometimes you use a grain bucket. And that, that was the piece of cake, right? That was the ideal. Then there's a third way, right? One is to guide or push. One is to lead. Then there's another way. Because sometimes none of that works, especially with lambs. And that's the third way. And it's just to carry them. Some of these lambs, they're just young. They don't know, and you carry them. And so oftentimes, especially dealing with lambs, that's when a shepherd uses a crook, right? Sometimes, um, for me, you just get around their stomach, you bring it up, you grab the lamb. Sometimes if it's a you and it's wayward, whoop, grab their, you like that, whoop, that sound effect? You grab their neck. Sometimes you can set it down on the ground, and they step into it, and you grab their leg, Right? So, put my crook down, but, um, and I guess the point there, you know, is a good shepherd knows, because think about it, again, he wants them to go to better grass, he wants to vaccinate them, he wants to do all this in a good shepherd, and you know, God's that way with us, right? Sometimes he needs to guide and push us a little bit, and one of our elders always talks about the Holy Spirit being a perfect gentleman, right? And I think what that implies is that he knows the right touch, he knows to stay out of that bubble, right? He wants us to have a little free will, right? He knows um, when to the little nuances. Sometimes, you know, when, when we are spiritually in tune with our shepherd and know his voice, he guides us, right? But then other times, like these lambs, he's just got to flat out carry us, just flat out, right? But it's okay. You know, that's the good shepherd. He knows. He knows what to do and how to get us where we need to be. But we have to be, we have to subject to the shepherd. All right, let me see if I can find my clicker. So the next criterion of a good shepherd is he knows his sheep and nurtures them. Isaiah, and this is a verse out of Isaiah that I love. And it says, he will tend to his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and he will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. So, um, so I've got a handful of lambs. I don't know if you can see, there's actually five up there. And I got boys and girls and babies. And this was a sweet time because we had just got done lambing. That means we'd had four weeks of just working 20 hour days, literally living in a sleeping in a barn, in a camper in a barn. Still wasn't that like great, right, right? I smelled like a shepherd after four weeks. And um, we're, that means in this case, we were ready to move them on. They had gone to a socializing pasture and all that stuff. We we're ready to move them on. So. Uh, but I love the verse and the image of God gathering his lambs in his arms and carrying in his bosom. Now, I, I'm on a, a little direct here, and, and I meant to share the story. I hadn't shared it in any other services, but one of the things that I heard while I was studying this is I'd heard of people, the image of, of Jesus carrying lambs around his neck. And apparently, I don't know if some of you all ever heard this in a sermon, that the shepherd would break the leg of the lamb, uh, he would set it, and then he'd carry it around with him for a while. Anybody ever heard that story? I, I've heard a few, yeah. As a shepherd, that kind of sounded odd to me. I understood the principle, because I think the principle was sometimes God has to do some things to us, right? Because what it was was when you broke the leg of the lamb, it couldn't, it couldn't stray, so it would have to stay close to the shepherd, or he'd have to carry it. But from a shepherd's standpoint, it didn't make a lot of sense to me because I thought, well, my goodness, I mean, according to this verse, I mean, how do you feel these lambs? I don't know that I'd go around breaking the lambs, the legs of my lambs. And then from a practical standpoint, I can't carry it all. And what if it doesn't set right? And then those lambs have to nurse, right? And if they have to nurse, they have to have their four legs. It's hard enough when they don't have four legs. So I did a little research. And what I found was that it was interpreted incorrectly. It wasn't B-R-E-A-K, as in snap. It was B-R-A-K-E, as in a weight. And what these shepherds would do, often, they would tie, I'm not sure if it was a rock or a stent or something. My wife said they do something similar with horses, but to, to the legs of these little lambs and they wouldn't stray, right? And the thought process is there that uh, that's what God would do to keep them close 
to the shepherd. And, uh, and, and I thought, you know, what a, what a nurturing and loving God. Yeah, he may not, even if we go astray, he may take some, you know, some action with us to keep him close. We're certainly not going to break our legs, I hear break our spirits. But he does put breaks in our lives, right, so that we submit. So, but anyway, this is a sweet, sweet time when we're getting ready to turn these babies out. And we get our lives back and such. And it, it really, you think about that verse Isaiah, holding them in your bosom. Uh, but it's not always sweet. The picture may be sweet, but when I bring this picture up, this conjures up some really painful memories for me. It was the lowest point um, in my shepherding career, if you will. Uh, and this is my daughter, Julie, when she was a few years younger. And back a few years ago, we had this incredible deep snowstorm. I don't know if y'all remember, we had several weeks of below freezing. As a matter of fact, we had one full week where it didn't get above eight or nine or 10 degrees. I'm not sure if you remember that. Well, I failed as a shepherd. What I did was, and again, you put in your boys, it's a five month gestation, that means they're pregnant for five, five months. You put in your boys with your girls, five months later you get a baby. So if you want babies in April, when the weather's good, or you want babies in March, you put them in around Thanksgiving or Christmas. A lot of shepherds put rams in during holidays because you just remember it, it's easier. Well, we had gone for the weekend, I had three rams and 150 ewes, and I, th I can't remember if I left the gate open or something, I didn't secure it, but those rams, while we were gone, ended up getting in there with ewes, and best we can figure, bred about 30 or 40 of these ewes. So here comes February, the worst time of the year, and these lambs start dropping. And besides predators and parasites for larger sheep, the number one killer of lambs is hypothermia. So they're dropping, and there's snow on the ground, and we're absolutely panicked. And I remember the whole family, I remember this day like it was yesterday, just jumped in there, right? And our goal was to save as many of these babies. It wasn't to save them all, because we knew it was going to be tough. And everybody was all hands on deck. And there's Julie. She's loving and, you know, in her bosom, right? One of these, one of these babies. And uh, it was pretty bad. I think in three days, I can't remember the total. I do remember that we lost 52 babies in two days, right? And it was horrible because we were, we'd get these lambs and I felt like a failure, right? I was a, I, I mean, I failed financially. That was a pretty big hit, right? Because it's not a hobby at that point, number one. Number two, I failed the mamas because they're babies, right? I, I allowed them to be bred at the wrong time. And their babies were born or dying, right? And I failed the babies, you know? And I remember we had this big pen. I know this is kind of a sad story, but we had this big, but it's reality, right? We had this big pen, and we were piling them on. It was a big pile of dead lambs. And I, I'll tell you, it was tough. I remember that day, started at 5 or 6. I was out there 2 o'clock in the morning, been working all day, and I was just about to give up. And my middle son, Jesse, put his arm around me. He said, Dad, it's going to be okay. Sun's going to come up, and it'll be okay. And, you know, you lost all these, but there's a bunch that we saved, survived. And I think, you know, and I think here in terms of a spiritual application, the good shepherd does hold his lambs close and tight in the good times and in the bad times, right? In the good times and, and we, you know, and on the left, I'm tickled to death and on the right, you know, uh, and, and I think that's the way it is with us, that our good shepherd is there, right? Regardless of what you're going through, good times or bad times, um, he holds us close. That's what a good shepherd does. All right, now, this is an interesting picture. This was taken on our farm as well, and this is a ewe with triplets. It does it happens, well, occasionally. It's not as rare as you would think. But there's a problem when, when these ewes have triplets. And you can see these are just barely born. You can see their umbilical cord there, and, and they're going back there to get some milk. It's really important when these lambs hit the ground, as quickly as possible, they get on their feet, and they get that colostrum, right? And, and, and you can just tell, right? But on occasion... You have these babies, either the mama rejects them outright, sometimes it's a new mama. We've had some mamas that just spook. They look at that thing on the ground, they go, oh my gosh, what in the world just came out of me? And they're gone, you know? All of a sudden now they're the charge of the shepherd, which is a lot of work. Sometimes it, triplets it happens often. Either the mama does it purposefully or the mama just can't, right? She cannot keep three babies. 
So, so oftentimes we end up having orphans. So I have a special guest that I want you to meet. And uh, you knew that I couldn't be talking about sheep without bringing one. Now, this is Tim Champion. Tim is a neighbor, but he's also a, a great, well, great friend. This is the roadie here. Let's hope. We've done good the last two. Whoa. All right. That had happened. All right. Let's see. We've done good the last two services. This is a little orphan ram, lamb. Just like I'm going to put a little lower, right? Because that's kind of what they do when they get underneath their mamas, especially when they get this big. And uh, it's a ram lamb, right? It's spotless, just like they would have sacrificed to use, you know, atonement um, in the Old Testament. It's fairly healthy. You can see it's got pink, right? It's not got, good parasi- it's not got any parasites. But it is incredibly, incredibly tame. If it, was, if it was one of those, right, number one, we wouldn't dare bring it out here because it would be spooked. Number two, they're so sensitive, I would hate to separate them from their mamas and could kill them. So in this case... Um, he's okay, he's fairly well socialized, and he loves this milk. That's the other trick. But um, I, I wanted you to, to see him and get a visual, and I'm going to let him drink this down just a little bit, a little bit more, because I want to tell you a little story uh, about him. You put a lot of milk in here, didn't you, Tim? <laughs> he's taking it down, isn't he? So here, you hold that. I'm going to try to do this. I've gotten away with it the last two services, and I'm going to try to do it now, and hopefully I won't regret it. So, although this is the last, uh, this is the last uh, teaching, so if I get messed on, I guess it's okay. So come here, everybody. Oh, oh, oh. All right. There's that bottle. All right. I want to tell you a story about a ram lamb about this size. When I first started uh, shepherding, uh, we used to keep them, we had a little paddock right next to us, and uh, there was a barbed wire fence, and on the barbed wire fence was another farm, and it was all grown up, there was thistles, it hadn't been taken, it hadn't been grazed in years, right? Well, as ram lambs, and well, you lambs too, tend to do, when they get to a certain age, they wonder, I'm going to take them over here to these guys a little bit, they tend to wonder, Right? And so, sure enough, what he did is he got through the barbed wire fence and got in that old pasture. And it was dark. I mean, well, it was probably about 3 or 4 in the afternoon. And I absolutely knew that if I let that ram lamb stay out past dark, it was going to be toast. I mean, it was the coyotes were going to get it. Coyotes were going to get it, period. Right? So what I did, what any good shepherd would do, I left my flock with the dogs. And by the way, the Bible talks about in Luke leaving them an open field. And I believe they were safe in that open field. I don't believe that God is reckless. And so I left my flock, the rest of them, and I started looking for my ram lamb. And it would, it would get caught in the thistles and the thicket. And I think I'd have it and I'd get in there, I'd get caught up and it would take off. And we literally played this game for hours and I was exhausted. But I'm telling you this, there was nothing. I was not going to let that ram lamb out there by itself. I don't care what I did. I wasn't going to let it do it. I wasn't going to do it because I knew what happened. Well, sure enough, eventually, a a battle of wills, right? It was caught in the thicket. I was able to go in, snag it. And I literally, because it was the easiest, I put it around my shoulders and brought it home. And, you know, I can't help but, again, we have that verse in Luke. And, all right, Tim. I feel something coming on. Hopefully that's... It's not on me, it's on you. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Whew. Whew. Dodge that. But you know, and, and, and again, you know where I'm going, right, with that. And that's the way God is, right? And, and so much more. I'm just a human, right? It's just a lowly lamb. Maybe at that stage, 50 bucks, maybe. As they grow, maybe 150 bucks, right? But if me, if I'm going to be that persistent, right, that determined, to make sure that lamb is okay. How much more God, our good shepherd, right? And the Bible tells us he's going to do that, right? That's why that scripture is not just a, that parable is not just kind of an interesting idea. Oh, the 99, no, right? He knew shepherds. He's the good shepherd. That's what good shepherds do. And God, our good shepherd, 
He will do and has done whatever he needs to do, right, to make sure that we're safe. So the last bullet, if I can find my clicker, Wait a minute, I may have turned it off. Yeah, I think I did. There you go. Oop. I've got to show you that one. It's the last slide. It's probably the cutest. This is one of our babies. Uh, I thought that was absolutely the sweetest pic- picture. But the good shepherd, the last thing, right? He, he protects. He, uh, he guides and leads and carries, right? That's number two. He nurtures, and he keeps you close. And number four, he loves you and sacrifices for you. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, John 10, 11. And this is where myself or even King David, all these earthly shepherds couldn't do what Jesus did. Because he went from being the shepherd to being that sacrificial lamb, right, that we talked about when we talked about the Hebrews and sacrificing those lambs for the atonement of our sins, right? He took on himself, and he wasn't lowly enough being a shepherd, then he took on himself, right? And he's referred to as the Lamb of God. And uh, we're going to have Louie and them come back, uh, and they're going to play one last song. And I want you to, as they're getting ready to come here, I want you to, we're going to have a song, and... Um, um, I'm going to sort of give you a call to action, if you will. There's some of you in here, and again, I don't want to be presumptuous, uh, that the thought of a God who is like a shepherd, that is that intimate, that sacrificial, willing to hold those lambs close, is a very foreign, foreign concept to you, right? You may think that God is an impersonal, big, autocratic type of being that has no interest in your personal well-being, right? And let me tell you, he does. He wants to have a personal, real, relevant relationship with you. He wants to do all these things for you. And so there may be some of you in here that don't know him, don't have a relationship with Good Shepherd. And I'll invite you during the song, however you want to do it. We're not going to manipulate you. Uh, Maybe come talk to us afterwards. Don't leave here until you know your shepherd, the good shepherd. There may be others of us, uh, maybe know the shepherd, right? But we're like Julie when she was facing the opposite way, right? We're just recalcitrant. We're tough and we're difficult. Um, and, and sometimes we feel like her, right? We feel like the, the odd sheep out. I, I didn't have very many black sheep. I actually had one, I think, all those years. They're very, very rare, but sometimes that's the way you feel. And, you know, that's, if you're willing to submit you know, God wants to be, he wants to be your shepherd again. And for some of us who have sort of forgotten, maybe we've become casual because life is good. I don't know why, right? Um, we've sort of forgotten the shepherd's voice. Maybe it's not that important anymore. Uh, maybe we're just going with the flow. I would invite you to as well to do a little introspection. So with that, I'm going to pray and then Louie and, 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 and the band are going to or play. So, Lord, we're thankful. God, we're thankful that you are our good, good shepherd, Father. We're thankful, Father, that you protect us, that you are your, you're willing to offer your protection over these spiritual predators that wish to cause us harm, over these spiritual parasites of sin that wish, wish to eat us from the inside, Father. But you, you offer us protection. You offer us green healthy, parasite-free, sin-free, addiction-free grass, Father. We're thankful that you guide us and you lead us and you carry us when we need you to. You know how to deal with us, Father, and you love us. And thank you, Father, that you love us, that you nurture us, that you think we are so important as individuals Father, that you would, you would treat us as precious lambs, that you would hold us tight in your bosom in the good times, Father, and in the bad. And lastly, Father, we're thankful. We're so thankful that you loved us enough that you gave up your throne, 
that you came down and lived a sinless, spotless lamb without blemish, and that you, Father, our ram lamb, died for us to atone for our sins. So because you want a relationship with us, you want us to be a part of your flock, Father. And we're thankful for that as well. I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray for myself. Lord, may be we aware of your presence. May be we real and impactful and purposeful in our faith. Lord, as we worship the one true God, the Jesus of Nazareth. And in his name we pray. Amen. In the process, in the waiting, you're making melodies over me, and your presence is the
Help us to be the willing, surrendered sheep that as you take our hands and you lead us on, that we actually follow. Help us to simply follow you and surrender to you and not stupidly go our own direction or follow leaders or voices out there that is not the voice of our ship. Help us to learn to know your voice and distinguish it amongst all the others out there. And we trust you. We trust you against the predators out there and the parasite that is our sinful nature. We trust you, Jesus, to guide us and to lead us home. We surrender to you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Saul. As we end on a note of...